what do we as Christians do with the old covenant law? How are we supposed to think about it? How are we supposed to approach it? And we talked about some different approaches, and I outlined for you my approach, and I'm going to summarize that approach for you again tonight. Just I'm going to draw up on the board first. It's in, it's in your handouts on, I don't know, the page with the colorful boxes, page 100, okay? But I'm going to put it up here on the board because this is the process. We've recognized that we're not under the Mosaic Covenant. We're not under that law. Um, we're under the law of Christ. We know that. And yet, all Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for us. The law, Paul says, is holy and righteous and good. And so, we looked in 1 Corinthians 9. We drew this process from some things that we saw in 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. So, <clears throat> what we have in these three boxes is first... We have the law itself or the commandment, the specific law, in its original context. Okay? Can't read it? Well, if I make it too big, I can't fit everything on there. All right, so we have the law in its original context. And out of that law, as we examine it in its original context, understand it in the historical backgrounds and all those sorts of things, out of that we're going to draw a universal principle okay, oops, I can't spell guys, a universal principle and the key to getting this universal principle right is to relate it to the two love commandments, one of the two, if not both, to love God and love one another. And so I cleverly call this the love connection. And then, once we have that universal principle that's in some way tied to our obligation to love God and love one another, I'm going to use these different colors since Jim was nice enough to bring me some new markers. Then, we're going to bring it into our own context with specific applications with specific applications for us. So, first, read the law in its own context, understand it, try to draw out a universal principle that expresses love for your neighbor or love for God. And then look at your own context and try to come up with some specific applications within your own context. That's the process that we're going to follow. And so we did that. Actually, we saw Paul do that. We saw Paul do that when he quotes from Deuteronomy, you shall not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain. And the principle that Paul draws from that is that the laborer deserves his wages. That's the principle that Paul draws. Okay, um, And then he applies that to the life of the church, saying that those who labor at teaching the word should be compensated monetarily for the work that they do. That's his application. He's not making a new rule or a new law, so it's okay that some churches don't or cannot pay those who preach and teach most often. That's okay, because he's not making a rule or a law, but he's coming up with a good application for believers based upon the principle that connects that law, which relates to an ox, right? But it connects it to love, love for one another, expressed within the church toward leaders. So that's the process that Paul follows, and so that's the same process that we're going to try to follow with different laws from the Mosaic Covenant. Now, sometimes it's easier, okay? Some are hard, some are difficult. Um, some laws, we'll just have to admit, I'm not really sure how to get a universal principle out of that. I'm not really sure. Doesn't mean you can't, just means I can't figure it out right now. Maybe somebody wiser than me will come along and help me to see it and understand it, or maybe it's just really, really difficult, all right? But this is the process that we're gonna follow. So, any questions for clarification on that process that I outlined and illustrated from, uh, from Paul's writings last week? 
No? Good. Okay. Awesome. All right, so here's what I want to do. I want to try to apply that process to another law. This is not one that we find specifically cited in the New Testament. Okay, so we're, we don't have the authority of an Apostle Paul telling us we're definitely getting this right. Okay, um, but I just want to try to show you how we might apply this to other commandments in the law. And I'm choosing a specific commandment that belongs to the ceremonial law, not the civil law. In other words, these aren't um, laws that we would typically associate um, with just, uh, you know, with the uh, government would enforce necessarily, or that we would think of as involving commerce or relationships between neighbors, okay? Ceremonial laws typically deal either with issues in the temple or with issues of cleanness, okay? So in purity, and the particular one that we're going to look at deals with purity, ritual, ceremonial purity. So, None of this is in the handouts that I gave you last week. We are going to get to those blanks on the last two pages of last week's handouts. This is all just, I'm just talking, okay? So, if you have a Bible, and there's some on the table, so everybody should be able to get a Bible, open up to Leviticus chapter 5. And the specific commandment, again, this is a, this is concerns purity, among Israel, the specific commandment that I want to talk about begins in verse 2. And initially, when we read this, our thoughts may be, this has nothing to do with us. We can ignore this and move on. All right, so beginning in verse 2, Moses writes, If anyone touches an unclean thing, whether a carcass or of an unclean wild animal, or a carcass of unclean livestock, or a carcass of unclean swarming things, and it is hidden from him, and he has become unclean, and he realizes his guilt. So he's become unclean by touching a dead animal, okay? And being unclean means a number of things. It means, mainly it means that you're going to be barred from certain um, temple activities, and then anyone you come into contact with is also going to be unclean, and they're going to be barred from certain temple activities. And usually the only way to rectify that sort of situation is to offer a, a specific type of sacrifice, which is going to be outlined for them. But he goes on, Or if he touches human uncleanness, and whatever sort of the uncleanness may be with which one becomes unclean, and it is hidden from him when he comes to know it and realizes his guilt, or if anyone utters with his lips a rash oath to do evil or to do good and, uh, and, sort of, and sort of rash oath that people swear and it is hidden from him, when he comes to know it and he realizes his guilt in any of these, when he realizes his guilt in any of these and confesses the sin he has committed, he shall bring to the Lord as his compensation for the sin that he has committed a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat for a sin offering, and the priest shall make atonement for, it, for him for his sin. So we won't worry about the oath portion. We're just, going to talk, we're just going to focus on the issue of being unclean. Now, what you have, one of the things you need to recognize is that beginning in Leviticus 4, verse 1, and I say we have to look at the context. That's the context here, literary context and the historical context. The literary context here, beginning in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 1, Moses is giving to Israel... Um, a process by which they can deal with sins that they've committed unintentionally. So this is entirely different from stealing something from someone, from hurting someone on purpose. This is an unintentional sin. And in chapter 4, he, apply, he talks about various unintentional sins that the leaders may commit. But in chapter 5, he talks about the unintentional sins that just an average everyday person may commit. Now, being unaware of this doesn't mean that it's not wrong because they still violated God's law. But he's not responsible to do anything about it until he's aware of it. And then once he becomes aware of his sin, he has to go and make the proper sacrifices to take care of that, to remove his unclean, uncleanliness and all those sorts of things. So the question now is, um, what does this have to do with us? What is What universal principle can we draw out of this law about someone who touches an unclean animal, unintentionally becomes unclean, 
and then has to go and make it right through a sacrifice. One of the things you have to understand is that the, the overarching purpose of all of these laws that pertain to ritual cleanliness have to do with the people's relationship to a holy God. All of these commands, and there are a lot of commands and laws about ritual purity in the Old Testament, particularly in Leviticus. All of them are aiming to teach the people of Israel that they are to be different and separate from the peoples that surround them, just as God is different and separate from them. And they are to strive to reflect the holiness of God in their own lives by living differently than the nations around them. So, let me see if I can, let me see if I can make this principle as clear as possible, okay? God's holiness demands that the Israelites keep separate from sin and unclean things. It demands it, okay? Now, in the New Covenant, that's still true. God is still holy. The difference is, and here we're moving out of their context, okay? The difference is, in their context, to be unclean means you can't participate in certain temple activities because the temple is the place where God dwells in ancient Israel, isn't it? That's where He manifests His glory. That's where His Spirit dwells. Where does the Spirit dwell in the New Covenant? Within us. We are now the temple of God. Okay. So, we, as the temple, we are to strive to be holy and separate, just as the Israelites were to strive to be holy and separate. And we are made unclean, not by the external things that we touch, like the Israelites were. We are made unclean by the thoughts that we have inwardly. So our, our universal principle, as we move away from the original context, we're turning away from outward actions to inward thoughts and desires. That's the move that you make when you move from Old Covenant to New Covenant. Does that make sense? Okay. And so we, in terms of specific application, we want to think of ways that we can be holy and separate in our inward thoughts and attitudes from the world around us. And there are lots of ways to apply that. So, for instance, the world will tell us that there is nothing wrong with having sexual thoughts about other people so long as you don't act on them when those other people do not consent. That's what the world will tell us. It's a very low bar today for what is accepted in terms of sexual behavior. The only rule that seems to exist is the rule of mutual consent. Just having a conversation about this the other day with Allie, and I was saying, I, I really feel like the only, the only thing that today is keeping children protected under the laws in Western society right now is the belief, both on a legal level, because it's codified in our laws, but also just generally in the culture, the belief that under a certain age you're not capable of consent. That's the only thing, really. Because the only line that's ever drawn anymore is consent. So long as you find consent, it's all okay. But that's not a biblical sexual ethic. We all know that. Because the Bible cares deeply about a lot of, in a lot of ways about what we do, but not just with our bodies, but what we think about with our minds. So that we could apply this by saying, it's wrong, we're not going to, as Christians... We're not going to look at things that will provoke those kinds of thoughts and desires. So specific applications. We're not going to... Obviously, there's some obvious things. We're not going to look at pornographic images, right? But you know yourself, and you know what things can trigger those kinds of thoughts and desires. And it may not be things that are overtly pornographic, but you know what it is in your own life, and so in your application of the laws of cleanliness, knowing that you are the temple where the Spirit of God dwells is, at all times you want to guard and protect yourself, 
even from unintentionally stumbling into those kinds of thoughts. Right? It can be. I just bust, busted my cup there. Sorry. It can be. I wouldn't jump to the conclusion that it automatically is. That, that, that I would never jump to the conclusion that sickness is the result of sin. Right? Because Jesus in John 9 uses the example of the man's blindness to say, neither this man sinned nor his parents that he was born blind. Right? So we don't want to jump. Thanks, Wanda. So we don't want to jump to those conclusions. Um, but we also don't want to say that can never be the case. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 11... When Paul talks about their abuse of the Lord's table, he says, this is why some of you are sick and some have even died. So yeah, there can be real physical consequences for our sins. Yeah. Well, and, I, and specifically, if we're talking, because we need to really focus in on believers, because right under Old Testament Israel, if you're an Israelite, the temple of God dwells in the temple. But under the New Covenant, if you're a believer, God dwells in the So when we're focused on believers, it's, we're very specifically told in Hebrews that God disciplines those he loves as a father disciplines his son. So he will not forever tolerate our sin. He will discipline us. And the absence of God's discipline in your life for your sin may actually be evidence that you're not his child. So, yeah. That's a good thing to point out. Now, we also do have to address the issue of the fact that they are commanded to go and make particular sacrifices, right? And so when we move into the new covenant, what we understand is the once for all sacrifice for our sins has been made. Right? So we're not going to take a literal application of that if we recognize that we have had impure thoughts or whatever and feel like we have to go make a new sacrifice. What the New Testament tells us to do, 1 John 1, 9 is speaking to believers. If you confess your sins, right, God is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you of all unrighteousness. And within the context of 1 John, it's clear that the, the forgiveness of sins and the cleansing from unrighteousness is all owing... To the, to the propitiatory work of Christ on the cross. That's in 1 John. Right? So when we find ourselves sinning inwardly and becoming spiritually unclean and polluting the temple of God, then we don't then go and try to do something for God. We run back to the cross where that one sacrifice has already been made. So you're always being careful as you think through these things. Okay? Now... <clears throat> Let me, let me just say a, a real quick word about what we need to think in terms of the teachings of Jesus on these kinds of things. Because what I'm saying to you here is actually quite similar to what Jesus does in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. He says he's not come to abolish them, he's come to fulfill them. Okay? Now... Fulfill does not mean necessarily do away with, but neither does fulfill necessarily mean continue to enforce them in the same way. Right? It doesn't. What Jesus means, he goes on to define for us. When Jesus talks about fulfilling the law, I think he's actually talking about doing what we're doing. That is, what Jesus does with each, each of the commandments that he cites is he cites a commandment that involves outward action toward others, and he turns it inwardly. So the murder command becomes about hatred toward your brother. The command about adultery becomes a command concerning lust. 
So Jesus is doing, I think, in Matthew 5, what Paul does with Deuteronomy and the ox, and what we're trying to do here with a law about becoming unclean. That is, he looks for this universal principle, and it deals and connects to love, which is automatically going to make it an inward issue. Automatically. And then he has specific applications for the context to which he's dealing with. Now here's the, here's the thing that amazes me. That I'm fully convinced that Paul learned to do what he did with the passage about the oxen from Jesus. Let me tell you why. There are a number of times in Paul's letters where he alludes to the teachings of Jesus, the earthly teachings of Jesus. So, for instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, where Paul talks about divorce and remarriage, a couple of times he says, Now I say, not the Lord, but I. And some people have taken that and run with it and said, Ah, oh, Paul makes a distinction between what teaching that comes from the Lord that's authoritative in his own opinions. That's not what he's doing at all. No. What Paul is doing is making a distinction between the earthly teachings of Jesus, the Jesus tradition, if you will, that Paul himself had received, and now Paul's further reflections and application following in the vein of Jesus. I'm saying that because that's what he's doing with the oxen passage. The principle that Paul draws, the laborer deserves his wages is not a sentence that Paul came up with. He borrowed it from Jesus. So far as I'm aware, it is the only direct quotation in any of Paul's letters from any of the Gospels. And it's from the Gospel of Luke. So, I'm convinced that Paul's following of this process with the passage about the oxen is Paul's application of Jesus' own approach to the law modeled for us in Matthew chapter 5. Does that make sense? Judy? Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people do this automatically without really even realizing the process they're going through. Yeah. Um, The value in laying the process out is so that we do it intentionally every time. Because naturally we tend to be, I think, inconsistent. We'll get it right a lot of times because we're praying and we're led by the Spirit, so we'll get it right a lot. Uh, But then we'll also inconsistently approach the Bible. And so we'll we'll do this with some parts of the law, and then other parts of the law we'll just carry over as if we don't need to do any, any of this work. We're not consistent, you know what I mean? And, that, and so we'll be, some places we'll, we'll handle it correctly, other places we'll handle it like a legalist, other places we'll go, oh, that has nothing to do with us, and we'll ignore it. What I'm, what I'm urging us to do is to try our best, with the Spirit's help, to use this process that I think is rooted in the teaching of both Jesus and Paul every time we approach the law, the Mosaic law. That's what I want us to do. Make sense? Which one? Ah, well, because it's the clearest example in Paul's writings. It's the clearest example where... No, 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 I get it. But it is the clearest example where Paul quotes an Old Testament text, specifically states his principle, because a lot of times he leaves his principle unstated. And you've got to read between the lines to move from quotation to application. But it's it's one of the few places where you get a quotation, a direct quotation, the principle stated verbatim, which he's borrowing actually from Jesus, and then a specific application in his context. So that's, that's why that passage... But it is, I get it. It's just the clearest example. So, what chapter in Luke? 
I didn't jot it down. I can't remember. I'll look it up for you in just a second. Craig? Oh, yeah, this is consistent, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus is doing this all the time. That's a really, that's good, that's a good point to make. Jesus is doing this all, out the, all throughout the Gospels. And it's not limited to just one Gospel. You see it in all the Gospels where Jesus does this. Yeah. Other comments or observations? Well, what I'm hoping to give you is a really good drawing it out like this, making it simple, even though I know it's not always simple to do, trying to simplify the process as best I can so that you feel like you've got something you can remember and you can take with you into Leviticus when you're reading Leviticus or you can take with you into Deuteronomy when you're reading Deuteronomy. All right, so... I said I was going to give you these last two pages, and I'm going to because I, there's something important that I do want to talk about here. Um, and that is, there's a, there's a word of warning that is necessary at just this point, okay? Because it's, it's possible, even though this whole process is aimed to avoid legalism, that's what it's aimed at, it's possible that we may misuse this process and establish an ironically legalistic attitude toward other Christians. So here's what I want to warn you against. That is, we must never elevate our specific applications of the principle of love found in the law to the level of another law binding upon all people. So remember what you're doing. These are applications, not rules. Rooted in principles, not rules. That are rooted in laws that were rules given to ancient Israel. Let me give you a couple of examples of this, okay? Um, Deuteronomy chapter 6. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, you have... Fathers who are instructed, it's right after you hear the, the Shema, the Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, right? And then there's a command given that fathers are to teach this law to their children. They're to teach it as they walk along the way, right? As they talk. Fathers are specifically commanded to teach the law of Moses to their children. Okay. So what's the general, broad, universal principle we could draw out of that? We could say, well, it is the duty of Christians to pass on biblical teaching to the next generation. We could be that general. That's fine. That's good. Um... Paul says older women are to teach younger women and older men are to teach younger men. There's clear New Testament warrant for that principle. Some people like to be a little bit more specific as they read that text, as they come up with a principle. 
And so they read that, and the principle they come up with is Christian fathers are responsible to teach the gospel to their children. That's fine as well. There's clear, right, New Testament warrant for those kinds of things. That's fine. So we have our universal principle, and we'll go with the narrower one just for the sake of this illustration. Christian dads should teach the Bible to their kids. That's a good principle. No problem there, okay? But when it comes to specific application, one specific application that I don't have a problem with, by the way, I'm not criticizing the application. So don't hear me as criticizing the application. But one, one way of applying this is to say, therefore, Christians, should, Christians would be well to homeschool their children and would also be well to be the only ones who are teaching the Bible to their kids. So <clears throat> the application is you're not going to drop your kids off here in our children's classroom because it's the dad's job to teach the Bible to his kids. Do I have a problem with that? Nope, I don't. Like if that's, if they're genuinely, if they're actually teaching the gospel to their children, and they would rather do it, say it's the parents or the dad's job to do that, we're going to do that, I have no problem with that. It's a good application of a good principle. It's fine. What I'm warning us against is elevating our application to a rule, and then trying to enforce it on others. To where we say then, you should not let your kids go to a, a youth Bible study or a children's Sunday school class. You're responsible to teach them. Don't hand that off to somebody in the church. That's making a rule out of actually a good application. Nothing's wrong with the application. But you see, applications are specific. And we can't blanketly apply them to everybody because when we do that, we turn them into laws. And then we become legalists without even knowing it. That's the warning. Whatever applications you come up with, as you are prayerfully thinking through this process... Understand, you can't just automatically say, now everybody has to apply this passage in the way that I have seen. Now, it's entirely possible that some of your specific applications probably should be near universal. I mean, it, just common sense would tell you that. But that's because any deviation from that would be a violating of the principle. What we're not trying to do is just come up with a new list of rules, though. Right, so when Paul, and you can do this with New Testament as well. Um, when Paul says that we are not supposed to associate with wickedness. Um, you know, one of the ways that I apply that in my own life is, uh, I just don't watch, like in general, I don't watch rated R movies. Now, maybe if it's a war movie and it's just a historical thing and it's just because of people are dying, I make exceptions, right? But in general, if I see a movie is rated R and it's not because it's a war movie or something like that, I assume that it's probably got lots of bad language, probably lots of inappropriate content, and so I'm just not going to watch it. I just don't, right? That's how I apply that. But then if I see another church member going into a rated R movie, I'm not going to then go grab them by the shirt and say, didn't you know you shouldn't go into any rated R movies? Like, that's my application. Now, it very, may very well be that they probably shouldn't go into that movie because of what's in it, right? But not because of the application I came up with for myself. All right, so we're going to have a lot of those. We're going to have a lot of specific applications for our lives. We can share them with others, and others may adopt them. But we want to be careful that we don't turn applications of principles into new laws. And that's hard to avoid because most of us are a little bit bent toward legalism. Most of us are. All right, so the, in terms of filling in blanks, the last paragraph on page 104 says, We must never elevate our personal applications 
of the love principle behind God's law to the level of a universal rule for all others. This is legalism. Ah, yeah, when it comes to these sorts of applications, we're going to be very, very hesitant to do any church discipline. Church discipline typically is reserved for clear violation of New Testament standards. There are commands given in the New Testament. I don't wanna, I'm, not, I'm not saying all commandments are bad. I'm saying when we're working on this to learn what to do with the Mosaic Law, we don't want to turn these into commandments. But there are clear commandments in the New Testament. Some of them are repetitions of Old Testament law, and that's fine. So, I mean, the, the clear commandment not to commit adultery, that's still in the New Testament. Or the, you know, the prohibition against divorce with the exception of cases of adultery. Um, those are still in the New Testament. Right? We wouldn't do church discipline over that. Right. We're going to be extremely hesitant to elevate anything like that to a need for church discipline. That church discipline shouldn't be instituted when it's an unclear line. Yeah. Yeah, it's not going to be an issue of excommunication. And I think that's what I'm having. When we talk about church discipline, we're mainly thinking, or at least I'm thinking of excommunication. But certainly, if we had any youth leader that did that, I'd be having a pretty stern conversation with them, and they may not be leading our youth anymore. Yeah. But they, we're not going to excommunicate them over it. Well,. Well, in that instance, they, would, they wouldn't have an opportunity to do it anymore. But, um, and there is a difference between persistence in something. And if the leadership of the church has made it clear that you're not to do something and you want to be in leadership, you're going to run into some problems there. Yeah. But we're going to have a pretty high bar. It's going to have to be something clear in the New Testament to get to the place of excommunication. I mean, in... In the entire 11 and a half years that our church has existed, we've truly, for moral reasons, only excommunicated one person. That's it. You know? Um, and it was a clear issue of unrepentant sin. So, in some of those situations, um, if I know them well enough, then my pushback will be, why? That's like the constant question. Um, I'm not saying that they have to give me chapter and verse for every principle that they try to follow in their lives. We can't always do that, right? That's the whole point of this process. Um, but... Like, if you're saying we can't listen to music with a certain rhythm or certain or with drums, I'm going to want to know why. And I'm going to push back pretty hard on that. Because I know, historically, that those theologians 
who've defended that view have usually made racist arguments. That's what I know about that particular issue. So I'm going to push really hard because they probably don't know that. They probably don't know where it's coming from. But there are, there are movements and Christian leaders who reject this approach entirely, right? This is why I'm teaching it. They reject it. And there are some who want to, it, to make almost immediately enforceable many of the civil laws of Israel. Okay? Um, Christian nationalism rejects this approach to the law of Moses. Huh? So they take the traditional, what I'd outlined as the traditional reformed view of the law. There are three divisions of the law, moral, civil, ceremonial. Traditionally, reformed theologians will say the civil and the ceremonial have been set aside, and it's only the moral law, okay, that applies. But these folks... Reconstructionist, uh, theonomist, there's a lot of terms for them. They want to say, no, 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 only the ceremonial law has been set aside. And that the civil law as well as the moral law is still in force and that secular governments, modern governments, should use the civil law of the old covenant as the foundation of our laws. Yes. Sometimes in extreme forms, yes. Sometimes. Yeah. And what I would say to like a, a Christian legislator, if I were talking to a Christian congressman or senator, what I would say to them is, you can do this as a legislator. You can apply this process. In other words, because our law is in some ways rooted, right, in Mosaic tradition. There's no denying that historically. Um, but we don't, we don't want to just skip this process altogether and say, for instance, apply the death penalty everywhere the Old Testament has the death penalty. We don't want to do that. Um, but we may want to look at some of those places where the death penalty is enforced and try to understand some basic principles that are there um, for the sins that are being committed there. And there may be some specific applications that are viable Right, even in a secular government. And if anybody balks at that, then I would simply say, recognize that private ownership of property, right, the foundation of capitalism, is rooted in you shall not steal. There's a reason why it's largely, not entirely, largely atheistic countries that become full-scale communists. There's a reason, historically. One precedes the other. So that in the Russian Revolution, first they had to get rid of the Russian Orthodox Church. They had to. Because Christian principles just won't let them do what they did. Same thing's true in Nazi Germany. 
Although there, they did it more sneakily by way of liberalism killing the church rather than the government killing the church. Theological liberalism, I mean. Killing the German church, no doubt. Denial of the authority of Scripture, denial of the inerrancy of Scripture, denial of the miraculous, all of those things. And the Lutheran church in Germany was on the death's doorstep when the Nazis came and they were powerless. You have to do that to the church, right? If it's a, if it, if it's a church that's culturally dominant, like you have the Russian Orthodox Church at one time in Russia or the Lutheran Church, and you have to somehow kill it before you can get rid of foundational principles rooted in the Mosaic Law like owning private property. So I'm not saying there's no sense in which we can draw out principles from the Law of Moses that we can use in secular law. I think, there, I mean, I think the foundation is there. But I, I cannot and I won't get on board with a view that just says let's import the civil law over as directly as we possibly can and let's recreate, or I would say create for the first time, but recreate some sort of um, Christian, quote unquote, Christian nation, right? Now, I'd, I'd prefer to live in a nation that operates by a biblical morality, right? But that's different than saying, I want to draw my laws directly from the Old Testament and apply them. Like, I, would, I want to live in a society where human life matters and it's valued. I want to live in a society where your private ownership of things is respected and I can't just walk over next door and take what's yours. I, I want to live in a society governed by those basic principles. But that's really different than that Christian Reconstructionism. And one of the reasons that today so many young Christians are falling prey to the podcasts of the Christian Reconstruction is because they've never been taught what to do with the law. And the first time they ever hear somebody really tell them something that sounds interesting that they can actually do with the law, they grab it. There's a better way. So I want us to know it. And it fits well within this study of the covenants. Because we're trying to understand the covenants in their historical contexts and ask the question, how do they relate to the new covenant? Yeah. I think it's helpful for us. And to be aware of the things that others around us are probably hearing online and maybe influencing them and instead of just getting upset with them and saying you're wrong say you know I think I have a better way to deal with those laws can I show you what I learned at my church and how we deal with it and then I'll show you that Paul does it and Jesus does it yeah. any other questions or comments we're a little bit over time did I get all your blanks or no oh 105 I'm just going to get read them out so those of you who need them filled in can get them. But you don't even really need this last page. So stated earlier, Christians have differed on how to understand and apply the law of Moses for centuries. So long as we agree upon the gospel and strive to love God and one another, honoring his word, then we should not allow differences that emerge from our different approaches to divide us. So I know Christians are continue, going to continue to disagree about the Sabbath. It's okay. Don't get too worked up. It's okay. All right? It's not the gospel. These things do matter. Okay? They matter. And Bible-believing, gospel-committed followers of Jesus will continue to debate them and arrive at different conclusions. It just is what it is. Okay? Even Jonathan Edwards who I would argue is probably the most brilliant American theologian of all time. Even Jonathan Edwards talked about how difficult reading and understanding the Old Testament law is. He says, There is perhaps no part of divinity attended with so much intricacy in wherein orthodox divines, divines means theologians, okay? It's an old term for theologians. Wherein orthodox, that is gospel-believing theologians, 
do so much differ as the stating of the precise agreement and difference between the two dispensations, the covenants, of Moses and of Christ. If Jonathan Edwards can say it's hard, then I'm okay with saying, it's kind of hard, guys. Kind of hard. That's okay. All right? Okay. We're done with the law of Moses. We're going to move on to the covenant with David next week. Finally moving on from the law of Moses to the covenant with David. So let me pray, and then whoever needs to gather children can. God, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you for delivering your law, your law through Moses, for teaching us through Paul that the law is holy and righteous and good. And I pray that like David, we would learn to delight in your law, but that we would also how, learn how to read it as followers of Jesus in the new covenant. That we would not be anti-law and flout our freedom in Christ and that we wouldn't be legalistic and bind the consciences of everyone around us. Help us to have a Christ-honoring approach to all of your word, including the law of Moses. We ask these things in Jesus' name.